we're now going to cover what I refer to as Unit 6, Mobility and Wheelchair Assistance. As regards the outcomes, there are four theory outcomes and two assessment outcomes. The theory outcomes, which we're going to cover now on this video are one, know the regulations designed to assist passengers with a disability in wheelchairs. Two, describe the different customer impairments and assistance measures that a driver should recognize. Three, know how to match the requirements of customers with a disability with the correct service. Four, know how to provide safe wheelchair assistance to customers who wish to transfer to an accessible vehicle. The two outcomes that you will be assessed on are, demonstrate safe wheelchair assistance to passengers with a disability who require entry and exit to and from an accessible vehicle. And secondly, provide safe assistance for passengers who wish to transfer from their wheelchair into a vehicle seat. You will carry out these practical assessments after you've completed the understanding of this unit. Outcome one, know the regulations designed to assist passengers with a disability in wheelchairs. So we're going to have an introduction into this. Some transport users, in other words, your customers, may have little choice in their selection of transport. They include the many customers within the community who may have particular problems in using transport facilities, in particular public transport facilities. This unit emphasizes the necessity of ensuring that drivers and support staff recognize customers with disabilities so that they are given the correct help and assistance to complete their journey in comfort and safety. In unit three, we mentioned that the Equality Act brought together in one act a number of different pieces of legislation, including the offences of discrimination contained within the Equal Opportunities Act 1995. It also includes all the taxi and private hire provisions from the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act, plus new duties for drivers and also their vehicles. Sections of the Equality Act 2010 that are specific to our industry, the taxi and private hire drivers, are section 160 to 172. These sections, as of January 2012, had not been fully enacted. Drivers who refuse to carry assistance dogs or passengers with a dis disability without reasonable cause can still be prosecuted under the local bylaws and the Town Police Clause Act 1847, besides the Equality Act. To refuse such a passenger, i.e. to be justified in refusing such a passenger, the taxi or private hire driver must have an exemption certificate from the licensing authority to give them reasonable cause to refuse that hire. You can also refuse the hire on the grounds of safety, whether that be to you, to your passenger or to your vehicle. Sections 160 to 172. We're going to go through these thoroughly. Section 160, taxi accessibility regulations. 161, control of number of licensed taxis. 162, designated transport facilities. 163, taxi conditional on compliance with section 161. 164, exemption orders for licensing authorities from section 163. 165, duties to assist a passengers in wheelchairs very important for drivers. Section 166, exemption from their duties, exemption certificates for section 165. Section 167, list of wheelchair accessible vehicles. Section 168, assistance dogs in taxis. And 169, assistance dog in taxis, exemption certificates. Section 170, assistance dogs in private hire vehicles. And 171, assistance dogs in private hire vehicles, exemption certificates, and lastly, section 172, appeals. Taxi accessibility, section 160. The Secretary of State may make regulations to ensure that it's possible for 
per disabled persons to get in and out of taxis safely. To do so whilst they're in that wheelchair. And once they're securely inside the taxi, they must be able to travel in safety and reasonable comfort. So you must have all the securing aids for that wheelchair because the passenger will need to do so while they're in the wheelchair. <clears throat> Staying on section 160, a taxi, i.e. A, black, a London Black Cab TX4, um, other specifications that need to be uh, included besides a ramp, so it's accessible, is the size of door opening, so it's sufficient to take a wheelchair when it's fully open. The floor area of the passenger compartment so that uh, seats can flip up to create extra floor space. The amount of headroom in the passenger compartment so it's comfortable for the passenger. And the fitting of restraining devices to ensure stability of the wheelchair whilst the vehicle is moving. You must have all the hooks, straps and anchor points as, as required. Section 160. Regulations also require that the hired vehicles to carry ramps and other devices to load and unload wheelchairs. This could also include hydraulic or electronic platforms. The driver is expected to position the wheelchair and the occupant in the correct position, ready to be secured safely. In the London cab, you can see from the caption there that the wheelchair would always face to the rear and it's secured with hooks, straps and clamps. Any driver or person who commits an offence by failing to comply or conform with any of these regulations is, a is liable to a fine not exceeding level three on the standard scale, a thousand pounds. Moving on to section 161, an application for a Hackney carriage license under the Town Police Clauses Act will be subject to 161 of the Equality Act. So licensing authorities that maintain a, a limit in the number of licenses under the Transport Act 1985 have to take into consideration the number of wheelchair accessible vehicles in their controlled area, in their licensing authority area. In other words, if they are regulated where Hackney cabs are limited, they have to consider the needs of any disabled wheelchair bound passengers, customers in their area to establish how many licenses need to be issued. Section 161, when it's enacted fully, uh, the license authority to have a, uh, will require to have a percentage of the tax of fleet as wheelchair accessible. So I've just give you examples, could be 10% uh, if a fleet is 250 or, or even 30%. Um, these are just examples. Section 162. Should a private hire operator have a franchise agreement with a transport hub, such as an airport or a rail station or even a bus station, they were required to meet the same standard of wheelchair accessibility as outlined in section 161 to 167 of the Equality Act. In other words, should they have that franchise at a transport hub, they will need to have a wheelchair accessible vehicle available at all times when services are running so that any disabled passengers coming from the train station or airport, et cetera, et cetera, has a wheelchair accessible vehicle available to them. Section 163, taxi license condition on compliance with the taxi accessibility regulations. Unless a Hackney carriage license has been enforced for a period of 28 days preceding the application, all new applicants will have to provide wheelchair accessible vehicle. This is for taxis, black cabs. The date, this day of information could differ between different areas and localities. Section 164. The minister may provide licensing authorities with the option of applying for an exemption order, exempting the authority from section 163. This will require consultation. So, consultation can be with local advisory groups that speak on behalf of disabled people, consumer groups such as care homes, sheltered housing associations, voluntary sector, could also be um, the local GPs. The licensing authority must publish in the local newspaper its proposals for how many wheelchair accessible vehicles they intend to have within their area. So, 
staying on the same theme, a licensing authority can apply for an exemption order if it believes that complying with the accessibility requirements and the associated cost to the drivers or owners of purchasing such accessible vehicles, the drivers would transfer from being hackney carriage drivers to private hire drivers. When exemption orders are granted, it may be uh, as a safety requirement, swivel feet, seats need to be fitted, even in saloon cars that are being used for private hire. Section 165, your duties as a driver to assist passengers in wheelchairs. Section 165 places a duty on drivers of wheelchair accessible vehicles, whether that be taxis or private hire. These duties that they're expected are to carry the passenger whilst in the wheelchair, must not make any additional charges whatsoever for doing so. In a saloon car, to carry the wheelchair obviously in the boot, if the passenger chooses to sit in the passenger seat, which would normally be the front passenger seat. To take such steps as necessary to ensure that the passenger is carried in safety and comfort. And to give the passenger such mobility assistance as necessary. So it could be that the passenger is non-ambulant and they need full mobility assistance. They are sat in the wheelchair. It may be that they're ambulant disabled, where they need assistance in walking or sitting or getting in and out of a vehicle. So mobility assistance also includes helping people in and out of the cab, using the ramp aids, positioning and securing the wheelchair. A driver must not charge a passenger in a wheelchair more than any other passenger for the same hire. That would be known as discrimination if he did so. Section 166, exemption certificates, which we have mentioned from time to time. These exempt the driver from certain duties. Within section 166, there are exemptions available to drivers whose physical condition make it impossible or unreasonably difficult for them to comply with the duties within section 165. In other words, whilst they're physically able to drive the vehicle they're not physically fit to assist wheelchair passengers so they can apply for an exemption certificate uh, from the licensing authority they will need their gp to provide medical certification as a requirement once that exemption certificate is issued it must be exhibited fully in full view in their licensed vehicle so the passengers are able to see it Refusing a hire to a disabled person is not justified where it involves direct discrimination or failure to make any reasonable adjustments to accommodate the passenger or even victimization. Justifiable reasons for, for uh, declining a hire from a disabled person would be one, if there's a safety hazard or risk to the passenger, driver, or also the vehicle, or as we've mentioned, you have a medical exemption in place on display in your vehicle. Section 167, the list of wheelchair accessible vehicles. If you are the driver of a taxi or private hire vehicle on a list of council designating wheelchair vehicles, you must provide assistance as outlined in one six, section 165 at no extra charge. So that you will be on the council's list as having an accessible vehicle. We're going to talk now about assistance dogs in section 168. Section 168 imposes a duty on a driver of a taxi or private hire that has been hired by or for a disabled person who is accompanied by an assistance dog. Also, that duty includes by another person who wishes to be accompanied by a disabled person with an assistance dog. It's an offence for the driver refuse to carry the disabled person's dog or to make any additional charges for doing so. Once again, this is direct discrimination. The private hire, that's, beg your pardon, section 170, staying with the assistance dogs, this time in private hire vehicles, a private hire operator or any member of his staff 
commits an offence by failing or refusing to accept a vehicle booking by or for a disabled person with an assistance dog. So should a customer phone the booking office and say that they have a, an assistance dog with them and they refuse to take the fare, that is direct discrimination. You cannot turn the job down. A further offence would be committed if the operator or any member of his staff makes an extra charge for the carrying of that assistance dog, which is accompanying the disabled person. Staying with offences by the operator. An offence is committed if a private hire driver refuses or fails to carry out a booking that is accepted by the operator. So should the operator or dispatcher send a job through to the driver and the driver refuses to take it because it's an assistance dog, the driver is committing an offence. By also by or for a disabled person who is accompanied by an assistance dog or another person who wishes to be accompanied by a disabled person with an assistance dog. The reason for the refusal or failure by the driver is that a disabled person is accompanied by an assistant dog. All these, uh, it is committing an offence. Just whilst we're talking about that, should the driver refuse to take the assistance dog and the dispatcher at the booking office takes the job off him or her and gives it to another driver, not only is the original driver committing an offence under section 170, uh, but also the operator is committing an offence because they've condoned that driver's behaviour. Within sections 165, 167, 168 and 170, there are penalties from licensing on a summary conviction to a fine not exceeding level three on the standard scale, which is a maximum of a thousand pound. However, the uh, police authorities could also take action because you are breaking the law under the Equality Act 2010, which carries a maximum of a two year prison sentence. So you could be jailed or fined. Exemption certificates for taxi and uh, private hire drivers. These are sections 169 and 171. We've mentioned exemption certificates now on a number of, number of occasions. Section 169 and 171 of the Equality Act 2010 permits a licensing authority to exempt a taxi or private hire driver from transporting an assistance dog if they are satisfied that the driver has medical grounds, i.e. severe allergy, or that the vehicle is not suited for the carriage of assistance dogs. There's an example there of an exemption certificate that has to be displayed in the vehicle. Uh, you might say, well, the customer has visual impairment or is blind. Nonetheless, it still has to be displayed. They may have somebody accompanying them in the taxi. Section 162, the appeals. The owner of a taxi or private hire vehicle who is aggrieved by the refusal to issue an exemption certificate under sections 166, 169 or 1671, or the decision of a licensing authority to include a vehicle on a list under 167, may appeal to the magistrate's court before the end of 28 days beginning with the refusal or inclusion so the refusal you should have medical evidence of your of your gp which would basically nullify the fact they can re, that they could refuse you or the inclusion as long as your vehicle is suitable you would appeal outcome two Describing the different customer impairments and the assistance measures that a driver should recognise. Recognise when passengers may need assistance, assistance dogs and types of impairment. Recognise when passengers may need assistance. We tend to use, in general, the term disability incorrectly. The definition of disability is usually termed as a physical or mental impairment, which has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on a person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So because of the impairment, they cannot take place in normal day-to-day -day activities that an able body person would be able to do. So the definitions of impairments and disability. Impairment is an injury, illness, or congenital condition that can cause or is likely to cause a loss or difference in physiological, your body 
the psychological, your mind or mental state and emotional state to function properly. The disability, as I've just mentioned, is the loss or limitation of opportunity to take part in society on an equal level with all the other people due to social and environmental barriers. Social barriers, it may be because of their impairment, they feel a bit embarrassed or even inadequate to mix with other people, or perhaps they're unable to communicate. Environmental barriers, roads, stairs, doors. Now, there could be a long-term impairment, which is normally more than 24 months or even for life. There could be a short-term impairment, which is normally less than 12 months, such as a broken leg, going to get better. Or it could be a chronic impairment, which is anything between 12 and 24 months. It's quite severe at the time, but it will improve and you will get better. Assistance Dogs is a dog which has been trained by a specific charity to assist a disabled person with a physical impairment for the purpose of the Equality Act. I've already mentioned refusing to take guide dogs or assistance dogs is an offence under the Equality Act and drivers have been jailed and have been fined for refusing such dogs. Assistance dogs, yellow jackets or harnesses are for visual impairments or blindness and burgundy um, is for customers with hearing impairments or that are deaf. There are two other jackets as well. A red jacket is for type 1 diabetes and a blue jacket is for epilepsy. To ensure that access to the vehicle, the support dogs must wear their respective identifying jacket so you know what type of dog it is and what assistance may be needed by the customer. Also, upon request, the owners must show their environmental health and identification card. This proves that the dog has been specifically trained by a specific charity. Types of impairments. Physiological, your body. Mobility issues or ambulant disabled, unable to walk or move about properly. Motor skills, lack of coordination, hearing loss and deafness. Blindness or partially sighted. Injuries, whether that be temporary or long-term, such as an amputation. Disfigurement, uh, which could cause social barriers. So it could be burns whether that be through uh, birth defects or through accidents. Psychological, uh, to be fair, there's too many to mention, but basically learning difficulties, mental health problems, uh, autism, Down syndrome. Um, to understand the needs of a disabled uh, person with psychological problems, you may need to get advice from the carer or parent or guardian. On the caption there, it's fairly obvious that that poor chap is blind. He has, however, got red rings on a white stick. This would indicate not only is he blind, but also deaf. At this stage of the presentation, just take five seconds or so to close your eyes and imagine what that chap's world is like. He has the sense of smell, the sense of movement, and the sense of touch. You need to understand that people with impairments will need assistance. So, it is very important that you feel empathy towards people with different impairments who are disabled so that when requested, we want to offer them the correct assistance and support. We realize how they must feel. To have total empathy and to usually offer the correct assistance besides asking the customer what assistance they may require, you as a driver need to have patience, courtesy and understanding. When writing about people with such impairments, 
you must avoid using terms such as the blind or the deaf or the disabled. It does not reflect the individuality or equality or dignity of that person who has the uh, impairment. So different types of impairment. Frontline staff, so carers, drivers, should always remain alert to the customer's capabilities, how able they are. They must be vigilant and recognize when to ask the customer if assistance is required. So when you see a customer with a walking aid, whether that be a frame or a stick or a crutch, ask them, do they need any assistance? Hearing aids. Now hearing aids can be very discreet. You might not be aware that the person is actually wearing a hearing aid. Push chairs, baby buggies, always ask the, the young mum, do they need assistance? Plaster casts or restrictive boots, etc. when someone has had a, an operation because they've got a breakage of a limb. Wheelchair customers, assistance dogs, mannerisms and speech difficulties, patience, courtesy, understanding. It is not condescending to repeat something back to the customer. What you don't want is any misunderstanding. If you repeat something back to the customer, they can confirm it with a nod, a yes, or a thumbs up. Larger people. It may be unsafe to take someone that is particularly obese into the vehicle because they can't use the seatbelt properly or even sit in the chair safely. Or if they're in a wheelchair, you can't push them up the ramp or help them stand up out of that wheelchair as you may cause injury to yourself. As I said about hearing aids, it may be the very subtle. They could have a cochlear implant. Remain patient and maintain the dignity for the deaf and the hard of hearing. So hidden, hidden impairments, definitely type one diabetes, definitely epilepsy, but it could also be a hearing aid. Whilst we're talking about type one diabetes, the passenger whilst they're in the car may require an injection of insulin and they may require to do so in your vehicle. Stop the vehicle whilst they um, do the injection and ask them to take the used cartridge away with them. They would normally have a little yellow sharps box on their person. If they haven't, pass them a tissue, ask them to wrap the car used cartridge in it and let them take it home with them. Outcome three, know how to match the requirements of customers with a disability with the correct service. Receiving bookings, practical assistance measures and penalty charge notices. The tele telephonist at the booking office is the first point of contact with the company. So the attitude and the manner of that telephonist is very important for all customers, but especially for people with impairments. Should they be taking a, a call from a care home, an elderly folks home, or an address where they are aware that an elderly person is living, they should be asking certain questions. Do you or any other people traveling the vehicle have any special access or traveling needs? Do you require a wheelchair accessible vehicle? Do you require a vehicle with a swivel seat? Would you prefer a saloon car? as our minibuses and MPVs have high floors. A saloon car is easier access. If there are any special requests or the answer that they do need some special requirements, the telephonist should put that as a job note on the job so that A, the driver is aware of what help is required and B, the next time that customer phones up, the request is already on the job. It is saved. For deaf people, uh, text messaging and callback is a, is a really good idea. Uh, receiving bookings, should you have a special uh, service, advertise the fact. Uh, it may be you've got certain accessible vehicles or your driver's been trained or you've got a website. Any flyers should be typed in dark, bold, uh, black typeface on a yellow background. 
as I said, if you have a website, advertise the fact that you have certain services. A lot of people with impairments will spend a lot of time in front of their computer screens. It's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's easy to update and make special offers. It's easy for customers to book with you and do business and request certain types of vehicle. Logos on your vehicles. Make sure you provide the correct logos on printed material, websites, equipment, and vehicles to alert your customer of your facilities. Wheelchair accessible vehicles. If it's not a London black cab, that symbol should be displayed. And if you have an induction loop for the hard of hearing in the vehicle, that vehicle should be displayed. That symbol should be displayed. Blind or partially sighted customers. The driver should always listen to what the customer says. Take instructions from the customer. A lot of people that have been blind since birth are quite independent and want to keep their independence. So they may refuse actual offers of help. Nonetheless, you can give safe guidance to the vehicle by talking to them, verbal communication. Just be careful, sir, the pavement's a bit uneven. Watch the curb, it's a little bit high. Just step to your right, there's some wet leaves. Verbal guidance for blind and partially disabled. Your vehicle, don't forget the customer cannot see that vehicle or what height the roof is. Ensure this safe transfer to and from the vehicle. When you get to the destination, ensure this trace transfer from the vehicle to their destination. Don't just leave them on the pavement. If they need to go inside a building, like a hospital or a doctor's surgery, provide the assistance to do so. Ambulant disabled people are less mobile in that they have difficulty in walking, bending, turning, standing, sitting. So elderly people in particular may be quite unsteady and require guidance and assistance when accessing uh, embarking and exit exiting the vehicle. Always ask permission before you touch or attempt to physically guide a customer to the vehicle. So ask them, do they need help and wait for their response. I mentioned learning difficulties. You may need to take advice from the carers, the parent or the guardians. With the customer themselves, please be very patient. Don't forget patience, courtesy and understanding. So be patient. Speak clearly yourself. Also, listen very carefully to what the customer is saying so you fully understand what the requirements are. When responding, do not overcomplicate issues as the customer may have difficulty in understanding what you are talking about. Respect the customer's dignity. Do not talk down to them. Do not hurry them along. So do not interrupt, finish their sentences or raise your voice. That is affecting the customer's dignity. Maintain eye contact with the customer. Particularly, this is true for people who have hearing issues as they may very well be reading your lips. Do not patronize or talk down to the customer in a condescending manner. Make sure you have practical assistance measures where communication could possibly be difficult. One, always carry pen and paper. Should the customer need to write instructions down because you can't understand them or vice versa. Always have a selection of local maps. This is so the customer could point to the direction or go to the index and read the direction so they can tell you that way. Maintain eye contact and speak clearly. When arriving at an elderly folks residence or a care home, don't sit in your car, get out of your car, knock on the door or ring the bell because they may need assistance walking to your vehicle and they may not have the technology where you can use your text back service. 
staying with practical assistance measures. Um, be prepared by always remaining alert. You can see from the caption, the elderly lady has a walking frame and the closer is to the driver is stood close by so that he can give assistance should it be required, should there be a trip hazard. So decide on your course of action depending on what the customer's instructions are. Offer assistance. Drive with particular care. The customer may be very frail, may be quite anxious if you're driving too fast or too close to the car in front. Always be willing to assist whilst maintaining dignity for that customer. It may be an elderly lady customer, for instance, may need her legs lifting into the, the well or of the passenger seat. Ensure your customer is looked after from the start of the journey to the finish of the journey. Door to door. Your duty of care extends to door to door from their property to the car, from the car to their destination. So, same with the same assistance measures. Do you need help with the wheelchair? Do you need help with your seat belt or getting in the seat? Once they're comfortable, please feel free to ask for any further advice should you need anything. Very important where reaching your destination where you have a wheelchair in the boot. Elderly people actually feel that they're a nuisance because they take longer to get in and out of your car. Because of that, they may try to get out of their seat whilst you're unloading the wheelchair from the boot. Tell them, give them instructions. Please remain in your seat until I unload the wheelchair from the boot and come round to give you the correct assistance. Before you start the journey, are you comfortable? Offer to help fasten the seatbelt. Do not lean across the customer. That would affect their dignity. With someone that is blind or has a visual impairment, they may need help clipping the seatbelt into the holder as they can't see it. With the customer's permission, decide on a safe course of action relevant to the type of disablement or impairment. Always drive with particular care. You don't want that customer to be anxious or to be thrown about in the passenger seat because they are quite frail. The emphasis, emphasis is always on the invitation and willingness to assist and help while maintaining the dignity of that person who has the disability. So that is particularly true for lady customers. Finally, ensure your customer is safely prepared for the next stage of their journey. So when they get out of the car, make sure they can get to their destination, wherever that may be, safely. Always allow a period of time to enable the passengers to fully access the vehicle before the meter is, is engaged. In other words, you do not engage the meter upon your arrival at the property, but you engage your meter once the journey starts. You have a duty of care. Give extra time for the very elderly and disabled customers who will take a little longer in seating and securing themselves. There is no extra charge for this slight delay. Should you receive a penalty charge notice, a parking fine, whilst generally giving essential help to a passenger, the driver should record the details of the passenger and the event and lodge an appeal to the licensing authority. The licensing authorities will support a driver where passenger safety is concerned. So they will take the appeal upon your behalf. Know how to provide safe wheelchair assistance to customers who wish to transfer to an accessible vehicle. Specialist equipment, ramps or platforms for wheelchair access, specialist or new vehicle design, swivel seats, low floors, so there's no big step up, designating seating space, special seats for where the wheelchair can be fitted. High vis grab handles for the visually impaired, non slip handrails, bell pushes to alert the driver, 
highlighted step edges, black and white stripes, black and yellow stripes. Dayglow guest destination information boards and iPads. These can be used as greetings at transport hubs such as airports and train stations. You must have securing devices, including all the hooks and straps as necessary. Visual and tactile aids. Customers with poor vision, the fitting of high-vis high -vis aids and handles, information panels and reversing alarms can give them more confidence in using the service. So, people have hard of hearing. Um, a lot of induction loops, which we just mentioned earlier, are fitted as standard now to the new London taxis. Also available in kit form that you could um, install in your own vehicle. A bonus for customers with hearing deficit. By adjusting their hearing aid to the T position, they should be able to hear the driver talk naturally and understand the full conversation. Within a TX4 London cab, when the red light is on in the rear of the cab, it indicates that the induction loop system is operational and you could talk and have a clear conversation with the driver, cutting out any peripheral noise. Swivel seats, which uh, are used a lot in the London TX4 cabs, are also able to be fitted specially for private hire saloon cars. These are very useful for customers who are ambulant disabled, have difficult with mobility issues. When in use, the driver should ensure that the seat is correctly locked in the correct position. You do not want any movement of that seat in transit. Illuminated visual aids. To help visually impaired customers at pickup points, such as airports and train stations, the driver could identify themselves and the client by using a small illuminated brightboard or iPad displaying the customer's name and the private hire company. Obviously, you need to make sure these are charged up. Um, with the bright board, there's a rechargeable electric power pack. It's actually integrated into the board. With the iPad, that's straightforward. You make sure it's fully charged before you start your shift. The name can be clearly illuminated when light conditions are poor. Normally, you would set it um, as a yellow background, with black bold lettering. Safe wheelchair assistance to customer who wish to transfer to an accessible vehicle. There are safety inspections of all equipment on accessible vehicles. The driver and the owner themselves must inspect all equipment on a daily basis. All equipment regularly inspected for defects and a re report kept for service records. In particular, you should be checking for frayed or damaged restraining harnesses and seat belts. Buckles and rings for damage and security. Make sure they're opening and closing properly. Any slack nuts or bolts. It's no good securing the wheelchair if the nut holding it on the floor anchor is loose. Any operational faults in the locking devices where the belt locks into the holder or holster. Make sure it is clipping in properly and can be released quickly in case of an emergency. With restraining harnesses properly tensioned in a V position, the brake applied to the wheelchair so that the wheelchair is stable and secure, you would then fit the straps and hooks. You would fit the carabiner, closed end carabiner hooks, with the release mechanism facing upwards so that it can be released in an emergency, always connected to the frame of the wheelchair. This must be never connected to the footrests and never connected to the wheels. In black cabs, you will have uh, hooks integrated into the bulkhead where the straps are secured from the vehicle to the wheelchair. A three-point harness is the preferred method of seatbelt anchorage. Uh, you will find these uh, in the TX4 black cabs and also some specialist minibuses. But some vehicle designs uh, may not have provision for the upper anchorage point. So just make sure that the wheelchair and the customer are, are restrained properly. 
On the black cab, the um, telescopic ramps are built into the floor of the cab, so it's a side entry. The wheelchair is facing to the rear, secure to the floor and to the bulkhead using the belts and attachments. The passenger is also restrained by a lap belt, usually on the wheelchair, and a diagonal seat belt. To avoid possible injuries to the back of the head, the bulkhead partition, the polycarbonate shield, uh, must give protection to impact, impact for injury uh, by fitting a padded headrest. It just slots onto the polycarbonate shield. When inspecting your equipment, if any equipment is defective, it must be taken out of service immediately. The action must be recorded and dated. You do not go to work, you take it to the repair centre. Repairs are then carried out in a timely fashion and the re repaired equipment brought back into service as soon as possible after the repair is completed and checked. I'm going to talk about contingency plans. You have a specialist vehicle, an accessible vehicle. In situations where there are un unforeseen circumstances, such as late running due to traffic or address er errors where you've been given the wrong information, there should be a procedure in place to immediately communicate the problem to the booking office so that remedial measures can be quickly put in place. So for instance, if you're running late, communicate. If you cannot find the customer at the address you've been given, communicate with the dispatch office. As many wheelchair passengers have doctor or hospital appointments, it's important that pickup times are accurately kept so that disabled passengers are not left waiting at hospital entrances or pickup points. So, one, going to the hospital, they will have an appointment time. You have to make sure that you are punctual so that they don't miss their appointment slot. Picking up from the hospital in a specialist vehicle, you must be on time so that the customer is not sat waiting for you at the designated pickup point. Should you turn up and not be able to find your customer at the designated pickup point, communicate. Either phone the customer if you have a mobile telephone number or phone the dispatch office who may have received a message. Should that fail, go into reception and ask where the customer may be. It may be they're simply delayed in another department or they've not completed their appointment with the doctor. So, on the contingency plan, if a wheelchair accessible vehicle has been booked, it's pretty obvious that any backup vehicle also has to be a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Always take care when loading and unloading wheelchairs and also their occupants around hospital entrances. It does require patience, courtesy and consideration, not just from you, but from other motorists. You must never ever block entry and exit points for emergency vehicles such as ambulances. With the wheelchair itself, at the rear, there are foot lever or a tipper bar. You just press your foot down on the foot lever, which will raise the wheelchair over any rough surfaces or hidden or high edges. If you've got hydraulic or electronic lifting gear, such as platforms or hooks, these have to be tested on the LOLA, Lifting Operations and Lifting Equipment Regulations 1998. Safety inspections are required on a regular basis. So, deploying, securing and stowing a wheelchair and the ramp. When transferring a passenger from a wheelchair, to the vehicle, you must carry out a risk assessment. So this is getting into a saloon car. Ask them questions. Question one, have you got the ability to transfer, transfer yourself painlessly, effort, effortlessly and safely into the vehicle? Question two, are you able to bear your own weight when rising from the wheelchair and you're now in a standing position? Should the answer be yes to both of these questions, which is the answer hopefully you're looking for, what you have to do to assist in the transfer is apply the wheelchair brakes so that it will not move. 
even though the brakes are on, you must still hold the wheelchair firmly so that it's stable for the passenger to safely transfer from the wheelchair into the vehicle as they stand. Once they're safely in the vehicle, you must be able to fold and stow that wheelchair safely and lift it and place it in the boot of your car for onward transportation with the passenger. With accessible vehicles, and the captions I've got is with a London TX4 cab, drivers have a duty of care to ensure that the wheelchair is safe and stable to use and that the ramp is properly deployed. So you must have a, a look to check for wheelchair damage and safe operation. For instance, should you not be able to pry the, apply the brakes properly because they are loose or broken, or there is a loose wheel, you can't carry that wheelchair and customer safely. You would have a valid reason for refusing the job. You must be able to deploy the ramp and fit it at an angle that it's safe to push up into the vehicle so you can maneuver the wheelchair inside the vehicle and secure it properly. I have a caption there where the ramp is with a pavement and where there's no pavement, where the driver can fit an extension on a tongue and groove which locks into place and has a little foot underneath for extra stability. So you can make the transfer up the ramp easier by reducing the angle. Or you can even have a winch fitted, which will pull the wheelchair into the vehicle as you stand behind guiding it. This uh, involves no physical effort from the driver. Remember, no matter what vehicle you have, you always go forwards into the vehicle with the wheelchair and reverse backwards down the ramp or onto the platform. On the journey itself, you would be sat in the front seat of your vehicle, obviously to drive it, whilst the customer, who may be unaccompanied, will be in the rear. You have a duty of care to ensure that the wheelchair is correctly positioned and secured. You have to be 100% sure that that customer is secure in that wheelchair for the journey. So you must be able to position the wheelchair correctly facing to the rear, and attach the restraining belt with the carabiner hooks to the wheelchair frame with the release mechanism facing, facing outwards for easy accessibility in an emergency. You must be able to tighten and tension the belts so that they are really tight and secure around the wheelchair. You must be able to fit the passenger seat belt across the passenger and into the holding uh, hold, buckle holder making sure that they are comfortable. Before you start the journey, check the wheelchair is secure, that the customer feels safe and is comfortable and prepared for the journey ahead. The ramp itself will have a screwdriver lock, which acts also as a wedge in the door so that the wedge is firmly secured. You would place the wedge in the hinge area on the door for the access side. The fold away ramp can also be folded out and as you can see put firmly onto the pavement. Check that it is stable and secured before you make any entry. Should you have an MPV that's been converted with ramps whether these be rear accessible or side accessible the ramps after use must be stored away safely. They can either be strapped against the rear seat or be put in a, a container cage underneath the seat with a closing lid. Any loose equipment is a hazard and is a risk to, of injury to your passengers, risk of damage to your vehicle. So it must be stored correctly. Finally, mobility scooters, of which we see a lot of nowadays. Deploying, securing, and stowing a wheelchair and a ramp, but with mobility scooters. Drivers are not expected to dismantle a scooter to facilitate its carriage. In other words, on that caption there, the seat on that scooter will come off and the, and the handlebar will fold down so that it's flat. You are not expected to dismantle anything. 
If the driver feels that to dismantle the scooter or lift the scooter entails a risk to himself or the passenger, it's unreasonable on the grounds of safety. You can therefore refuse the job. These scooters are particularly heavy and some of them carry two batteries. You may injure yourself in attempting to lift that scooter, even though it's folded. Also, if the, if the driver is able to get the scooter into the vehicle, you would be unable to secure it. It would therefore constitute a risk. So the driver once again is justified in refusing the, refusing the fare on the grounds of safety. The next two outcomes are both practical assessments. One is demonstrate safe wheelchair assistance to passengers with a disability who require entry and exit to and from an accessible vehicle. And the second one is providing safe assistance for passengers who wish to transfer from their wheelchair into a vehicle seat, usually a saloon car. That concludes unit six. Thank you. Make sure you have a full understanding and good luck with your assessments on the practical outcomes.